Can you imagine a different Glasgow? A Glasgow where women are commemorated in statues and streets and buildings. Sarah Sheridan wrote the guidebook to that alternative city, Where Are the Women? Each fictional street, building, statue or monument is dedicated to a real woman and tells their stories. In a 2016 survey by English Heritage, 40% of respondents thought women did not impact history as much as men. The stories of thousands of pioneering women have been untold, set aside. Our contemporary view of Glasgow, The Night Map, drawn by artist Will Knight as part of our Gallus Glasgow project, invites us to reimagine the city, to draw, to redraw, to consider what is, what once was, and what's yet to be. We invited Sarah to our offices to map out her imaginary city on the night map. So this here is George Square in real life and I created Victoria Square and there are nine statues in this square, actually not all really clear here, and there are one woman, Queen Victoria, loved a statue, and eight men and so I replaced those statues with uh, Jean Roberts, one of them, who was, uh, I think that one was Jean Roberts because it's right in front of the city chamber. She was Glasgow's first female provost. Um, she um, got very involved in the planning of the new towns in Scotland. And then I created a digital memorial to um, Marion Henry. And I think that hung on the front of the city chambers, which is just here. She was a communist. And um, she uh, helped organise the hunger marches to uh, London in the 30s. Um, and the Henry, I called the monument the Henry Board, um, and it displays the city's minimum wage in the book because that was the sort of thing that she um, campaigned about, the living wage, the average wage, and the gender pay gap. So it's up on the city chambers so everyone can see it. And I think someone should make this memorial. And then on this corner here, no, this corner here, I put Eunice. And Eunice Murray was a suffragette. And they said if you heard Eunice Murray speak, you would immediately want women to have the vote. She was so convincing and so passionate. Um, she was really well known and they toured her around the whole of the UK talking about how important the suffrage was going to be and how it was going to change the world and improve the world for everybody. I have a quote here from her. It is prejudice, not reason, that has delayed the emancipation of women. Every step forward has been won in spite of prejudice, but it is reason, not might, which should govern the world. Go Eunice. Amazing. Um, and then Jane Allen, who was another militant uh, suffrage campaigner. So I kind of had this side, all these women who were really political. And that was one of the things I found when I was researching Glasgow. It just had this real strong contingent of women who got involved in politics. They were campaigners um, and, and they were really effective. Yeah. Um, and we've only heard of a few of them. We were, I was about to say, we all know about Mary Barber. Mary Barber, but Mary Barber was not alone. Yeah. You know, she had, and that's why that statue has all the other women in it. Uh, and many of these women knew each other. You know, Eunice Murray would have been a bit older than Jane Henry, and so she would have been someone that Jane Henry looked up to. Uh, and they inspired and, um, and strengthened each other's arguments, I think. And then Agnes Dolan, who became Lady Dolan. So this is the other side of the political spectrum. Um, she was an activist and speaker for the women's social and political movement and the women's labor, labor, leave, uh, labor uh, league. And then on the southwest corner, so we can't see the southwest corner here. It's, it's just, <laughs> Things have changed it's rather. It's there because there's a building in the way of this statue I made up. Uh, Jamie Buchan, who was a, a labor member of the European Parliament. And, and she was a great campaigner and also got involved in the Scottish music scene. She was a, a very musical person um, uh, uh, and an early sport of gay rights as well. So she was somebody who, who did a lot of campaigning. Another stalwart of uh, Scottish Labour next door to her, uh, Agnes Hardy. Um, she was another talented platform speaker, someone who went out and in the days of these huge political meetings could stand up and command, you know, an audience of 5,000 wasn't all that unusual. And she was involved in the Glasgow Trades Council and she was an organiser of the, um, uh, uh, in the Labour Party during the First World War. She was an MP, she was a pacifist and she was nicknamed the housewife's MP because she got involved in the supplies of food uh, on the home front. So she spoke a lot about food shortages and rationing at Westminster. So 
So this is the Gala Gate running on the east side of the city along to the Barris Ballroom. And along here I created the Women's Sports Museum. Um, and we've taken it up here just on a park, what is an existing park. So we're just gonna call it the Sports Museum. And let me tell you about some of the imaginary exhibits in this uh, museum. So um, Helen Holm, who was a golfer, uh, she's pretty extraordinary. She represented her country during the 30s, 40s and 50s. Um, so she was a long term, you know, 30 years of a career in international uh, golf. Nancy Reich, who was a swimmer. Uh, she broke 28 British and Scottish swimming records. Um, and she, was, she traveled a great deal as well. Helen or Gordon. Also a swimmer. We have quite a lot of swimmers in Scotland, maybe because <laughs> it's an indoor sport, it could be. Um, she got the Nancy Reich medal, so there is a Nancy Reich medal um, for her services to swimming, and she won an Olympic bronze uh, in the 200 meter breaststroke in 1952. So she's a 50s swimmer. Uh, Catherine Gibson. Uh, she again had another swimming career, Britain's only swimming uh, trophy won in the 1948 Summer Olympics was won by Catherine Gibson uh, Ellen, Elizabeth King, again another uh, Olympian, Scottish Olympian. Um, she represented Great Britain actually twice in the Olympics um, and Scotland at the inaugural British Empire Games in 1930. So these are all early 20th century uh, sports women. And Bella, uh, Bella Moore, and Bella was another swimmer. And then on this side, I'm gonna put some different sports. So, sorry, hockey player, Marjorie Langmore. Uh, she represented Scotland internationally at hockey uh, and at badminton and at tennis. She's just really good at both sports. <laughs> and in 1933, she captained the only Scottish women's hockey team to beat England between uh, 1909 and 1972. So um, she was a leader, I suppose, as well. Charlotte Beddows, Scotland's hockey captain in 1905. So these two women uh, knew each other. And she also won several golfing championships. So quite often you find this in early 20th century sport. You don't specialise to the way that we specialise today. So people might be doing two or even three sports that are kind of uh, related. Um, more golfers, Dorothy Lee. She was uh, uh, Dorothy Lee Campbell. So this is one of the other problems actually when you're researching women's history, which is really interesting people get married mm. and they add on another name and then you, you're like, is that the same person or is that? Um, and quite often people use two names. So she was the first woman, Dorothy Lee Campbell was the first woman to win the US, UK and Canadians Women's Am uh, Amateur Golf Champions uh, Championship and Ethel Jack, who also played golf for Scotland um, 1955, 1964 was kind of when Ethel Jack was winning things. And then in tennis, we have Winnie Shaw, uh, twice made the semi-finals of the French Open and in 1973 played in the double semi-final at Wimbledon. Um, I suppose we're just, we're not short of sporting talent. Absolutely, look at that list. In Scotland. And it's really interesting when you talk to people uh, about this particular section of the map, they quite often say, oh, I didn't think we had any women sportsmen at all, like women sports people at all, we didn't, we didn't think we had anyone. We have hunters. So this little bit here, this is actually a real statue to a woman, one of Glasgow's, I think, seven or eight statues to women. And this is Dolores Ibaruri, Ibaruri. My Spanish is not great. And uh, she's known as the Pasionara, and um, this is inscribed with her words. Um, she was a fighter during the uh, Spanish Civil War. Better to die on your feet than live forever on your knees. Go for it, Dolores. And we had in Glasgow, there was a great contingent of uh, people who were involved in volunteering to fight against fascism in the Spanish Civil War. And so I put up two other memorials in the book 
um, that were around that. One is to Ethel Camellia MacDonald, and um, she went to Spain during the Civil War and broadcasted in English for the Anarchist Radio. Um, and she was known as the Scott Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh, wow, a that's a, a pretty a awesome. Thing going. <laughs> and um, Margot Bennett, who was a screenwriter, she was a crime novelist, uh, and she was a lifelong CND uh, supporter, and she also went to the Spanish Civil War. But these were not the only women who got involved in, in the war in Glasgow, because many of the men who went away to fight left their women folk and left their children and those women banded together because they had a really difficult time actually surviving through you know 19 19 early 20th century glasgow was quite tough if you didn't have much money there weren't a lot of jobs about um and so those women indirectly kind of contributed towards the, their guys going away to fight in the war they were the ones that were left at home and i don't think we should forget them either and in the book i put a, um, a monument up to them as well this is the lighthouse in central Glasgow and um, in here I put a monument to a writer called Catherine Carswell and she was fired from the Glasgow Herald uh, for writing a review of the novel The Rainbow by D.H. Lawrence. She was friendly with D.H. Lawrence and there were rumours that they were lovers. I don't know if they were lovers, just trying to stay out of everybody's pants in history. Um, it's a tough job if you're a novelist. <laughs> Um, but anyway, one way or another, she loved his book and she reviewed it and it went into the Glasgow Herald and she got fired because it was actually a banned book. It, was a, wow. it had been taken off uh, the shelves and she wrote an amazing um, biography called Open the Door or autobiography called Open the Door. Uh, and she also uh, uh, wrote um, a biography of Burns. And she wrote the first real, it was the first time really that Burns's legacy had been examined not as a hero and so she talked about his womanizing she talked about you know the that kind of murky underbelly of mm. burns's existence and the way that he treated the women in his life and she got sent a bullet in the post people were raging um, and it, it was quite a threatening situation i think that she got into because of her burns uh, biography so off the map pretty much at the Glasgow Women's Library so let's put her with Catherine. Okay. I put up a, a monument to Helen McFarlane who's another Glasgow writer. She was from Barhead and she wrote the first English translation of the Communist Manifesto. So it's quite an important book. Helen McFarlane um, and, and for the purposes of this little cluster here we'll put her with the other writers um, uh, uh, next to Catherine. Um, and uh, another non-fiction writer who wrote an important book, Runa Simpson. Uh, she was a sociologist, she was a campaigner, and she um, wrote a book called Living Alone. She co-authored it. And Living Alone explored the population um, explosion that was going on and falling fertility rates in the mid 20th century and what she felt that was, that was going to lead to the kind of lifestyle changes that people were gonna have to make. So we'll put uh, her, up here as well and then one of my favorites because we're not short of writers in Glasgow of course <laughs> but I'm just trying to stick to three Agnes Brisson Morrison she was a novelist and a biographer and she secretly wrote 27 romances and she had a pen name Christine Strathern um, and her authorship of these rom romance novels was not discovered until about 30 years after her death and um, she was that's how good at keeping a secret she was um, one of, uh, she wrote a book called uh, The Gauk Storm, which is quite famous, uh, and uh, Love in the Mist. So she wrote under both names more serious books that were um, considered quite literary. And then these romance novels that obviously did brilliantly well, but you know, she kind of kept hidden under the carpet. I love that for her. Agnes Brisson Morrison, or is she Christine Stuthern? I don't even know. This is the Mitchell Library, just on the M8. You can see the M8 coming up here, Mitchell Library. Um, and we're going to do some more writers, some more Glasgow writers. So um, among one of the most interesting writers I found is a woman called Ray Tannehill. And Ray Tannehill was an early cookery writer, um, and a historian and a novelist. And she wrote a book called uh, The Food in History. And it's all about where our food comes from and how recipes develop and it's a really interesting book. I have a friend who is a cookery writer and she did not even know that Ritana Hill was from Glasgow and she was. So we're going to put her here uh, on the, on the, um, uh, 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 in the Mitchell Library. And then uh, a poet called Veronica 
uh, Forrest Thompson, um, uh, who inspired Edwin Morgan to write a 10 poem sequence in tribute to her. Um, she was a great uh, writer in her own right, so I think we need at least one poet coming out of Glasgow <laughs> on the map today. So we're going to go for, uh, for Veronica um, and Peggy Morrison as well. So Peggy Morrison, she's another woman who wrote under a pen name. It's quite interesting, she didn't really choose a male pen name, because quite often when women write under pen names, they do it under an assumed male pen name. But she um, wrote hugely successful novels in the mid-20th century under the name March Cost. And her most famous, The Bespoken Mile, tells the story of a cabaret dancer who inherits a house uh, in the country and all the adventures that, that they get into. So it's kind of early, you know, property porn, maybe. Um, and a last one, I think, a novel, uh, uh, a novelist called Marion Lockhead, um, and she wrote poetry and biography and history. A lot of these women wrote across an impressive range of topics, um, and I really relate to that as a writer myself. I write, you know, I write non-fiction, I write fiction, and I've written poetry, and I've written other things. And it's it's a really interesting thing that happens to your brain being stimulated in different ways. And so when I find other writers doing this in 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 the past, they're kind of my foremothers. So um, Marion Lockhead, I think, has to be has to be one of mine. Oh, and last of all. Um, there is a painter that I put in the Mitchell, and I put her in the Mitchell because it was quite near where she lived. Margot Sandeman, she was a really good friend of um, Joan Eardley, and she collaborated with the poet um, Ian Hamilton Findlay, and she worked as a code breaker in Bletchley Park as well. Cool. So um, she did beautiful paintings um, of landscapes in rural settings and interiors, and um, I uh, uh, and, and she uh, painted also some of Glasgow's creative community. So she was a neighbour to a guy, dramatist and poet called Robert McClellan. They were really good friends. And she did a, a portrait of him that's quite famous as well. So we're going to pop her in the Mitchell too. So we've got this crane on the map. Now this crane is not the Finiston crane, which is <laughs> further along. Just to make clear. Just to be really clear here. But we found a crane on the map, and in uh, Where Are the Women, I, I created a monument on the Finiston crane. So we're going to adopt this crane, and we're going to memorialise uh, the women who were adopted on the Finiston crane in the book here on this crane, which is no longer there because the building work is over and done with. Um, and what I did was I, I hoisted an enormous screen on the crane in the book, and um, projected images of some of Glasgow's film stars and actresses. Um, and so on this crane, we're gonna memorialize Mary O'Rourke, who appeared as a boy soprano um, in variety of performances, and she regularly picked up, uh, packed the Metropole in Stockwell Street, but later in life, she appeared on STV's One O'Clock Gang. So she was really famous on the, on the, on, on the stage, but also then on the television, so Mary O'Rourke. Um, May Moxon, who was a child performer uh, on Glasgow's Cine Variety shows and went on to find a troupe of dancers. Um, and the Waddle sisters, Bertha and Jenny Waddle, who were writers and directors and costumers, and they were really interested in children's theatre. And so they toured Scotland and they played the Royal Nur Nurseries in Glam's and Balmoral and in Buckingham Palace too, several times. Um, footage of what they did is actually quite rare, but um, if you, it, there is some vintage material of, of their performances, so that's going on the crane. Molly Weir, who acted in radio plays and was uh, most popularly known as Hazel McWitch when I was growing up uh, in this children's series, uh, Rent a Ghost. And the song Molly's Lips, written by Glasgow rock band The Vaselines, is dedicated to um, Molly Weir's lips. Um, uh, and it was made famous by Nirvana, so Nirvana covered that song. Janet McLucky Brown, who was a um, impressionist, and uh, she was, uh, and she did very, most famous probably for doing impressions of Margaret Thatcher. Um, so she, so we're gonna we're gonna memorialise Janet Janet Brown McLucky Brown on, on this screen as well. And I think that's all we're gonna be able to fit down the side. Um, but we might go back in the other direction uh, and do some more writer, some more actors and dramatists, and um, people who wrote for the stage in the Citizens Theatre at the other end of the map. 
theatre in Glasgow, you come over the bridge and come down and it's somewhere down here. We're moving it up for the purposes of the map. So we can commemorate <laughs> these amazing foremothers that we have. And these are more women in film uh, and drama in Glasgow. So um, Elliot Mason, who is an actress who appeared in many Ealing comedies. Uh, Deborah Kerr, who was a Golden Globe winner and three times winner of the New York Film Critics Circle Award. She was a six time Academy Award winner as well. Mary Gordon, who appeared in more, 200, more than 200 films, including Bride of Frankenstein, um, Bonnie Scotland and Fort Apache, lots of these kind of B-listed films. Um, she also, Mary was also a member of the Hollywood Canteen, which entertained troops during World War II in Hollywood. And lastly, Mary Ur. Um, she was another celebrated Hollywood actress who first won critical acclaim for her role in Look Back in Anger. Uh, and she also was nominated for an Oscar in her role uh, in Sons and Lovers. So D.H. Lawrence making a wee appearance here again. Uh, so we're going to commemorate this little bunch of women down here near the Citizens Theatre because they're all actors. So this up here is Glasgow University, up here in the hill. And we're going to commemorate some women here. Um, Marianne Gilchrist, who was the first woman to qualify in medicine at a Scottish university. And she was also a prominent suffragist. No, she was a suffragette, actually, sorry. She was one of the militant ones. Um, and she was chair of the Glasgow Division of the British Medical Association. She was a really eminent woman who um, studied at Glasgow. Um, also, um, Gilchrist signed the uh, death certificate, actually, of another amazing Glasgow woman, an heiress called Isabella Elder. And Elder Park is named after, uh, well, she donated Elder Park to the city. So um, Glasgow, one of the things I found when I was researching Glasgow was a number of quite interesting heiresses. Mm -hmm. There were a number of women who didn't marry quite often and inherited huge amounts of Glasgow fortune probably got in the tobacco trade and the slave trade, I think mostly, but they, but they did genuinely try and do good works, um, like Isabella. Um, another university uh, pioneer um, is uh, Jessie Campbell. Um, oh, sorry, wrong thing. Um, and she promoted higher education for women. So this is something that very much happened within Glasgow and actually also in Edinburgh, Scotland, sort of two main cities. There was a huge campaign for higher education for women because women weren't allowed in universities and it started really quite early um, uh, in maybe the 1860s. Uh, it was much, much later that women were actually welcomed as, as, as students and able to graduate. Um, and so she um, arranged lectures for women originally, I think, in natural history and moral philosophy and English literature and astronomy and all these subjects, not medicine. They didn't want any women <laughs> messing around in medicine, but um, she was a pioneer. Uh, Janet Galloway, who was the uh, honorary secretary of that association campaigning for um, higher education for women. Frances Melville, the first Scottish woman to graduate as a Bachelor of Divinity. Mm -hmm. um, so she was a suffragette, uh, suffragist and an advocate for uh, higher education for women as well and um, uh, later she became mistress of Queen Margaret College. So these women spent their entire lives campaigning, uh, opening the way for other women to be educated um, and to extend the right to education uh, to women. And then also we're going to include some plaques here to ex-students um, Meraby Areskar Vinkil, who in 1897 was the first Indian woman to graduate from Glasgow University, uh, and Muriel Clara Bradbrook, a literary scholar and Shakespeare specialist who became Professor of English and Mistress of Girton College in Cambridge. So um, Glasgow has some huge academic leading lights who um, uh, should be commemorated right up here at the University. We made a big red dot on some of the Glasgow School of Art buildings and um, we definitely got the most amazing um, legacy uh, that the art school has uh, created for Glasgow um, and a lot of women who trained here um, and we're also part of this club here on Blyswood Square so the second one along on that side on the north side was the Lady Artists Club 
And if you were a lady artist, it was the first residential club for women in the UK and was set up by a number of women who had trained at the Glasgow School of Art. And the door was designed by Charles Rennie Macintosh. And I'm like, ladies, could one of you not design the door? <laughs> this Pull your finger here. out, lady artists. <laughs> we're back at the uh, art school and we're going to talk about some of Glasgow's artists. Um, I'm going to start with Hannah Frank because she was amazing. She was Jewish and she was the youngest, known as the youngest uh, Gla uh, Glasgow girl. So the youngest of that set, that uh, mid 20th century set of women who trained at the Glasgow uh, School of Art. And she did amazing illustrations in black and white and they haunt me. So I'm putting Hannah, uh, Hannah first. Um, but probably the person who should go first, of course, is Margot Macdonald Macintosh. His husband, you know, Charles uh, Rennie Macintosh, the painter and designer, said of her, Margaret has genius, I only uh, have talent. And um, Charles, you were right, and Margaret is not remembered enough. Um, and also Jude Burkhauser, who staged an exhibition of the movement at Kelvin Grove Gallery, way over in the West here, um, in 1990. And she declared, uh, women in the arts have been starved for stories of other women tales of these maverick sisters who they might learn from. We followed in one another's footsteps, knocking on doors, asking the same questions, rediscovering fire, the wheel, electricity, because there was no record of our past. And so the work that Jude did in commemorating many of these women is really, uh, really important. Um, and that I remember going to that exhibition at Galvin Gold Museum and just thinking it was amazing that I hadn't heard of any of these women. And of course then ended up a book that included a lot of them. Um, on display in that Glasgow Girls collection, the work of Kathleen White, who is an a, a embroiderer, textiles expert, uh, a teacher of textiles art. Um, her, a lot of her work is in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Helen Paxton Brown, who specialises also in embroidery and book binding. Uh, De Courcy Luthwaite Dewar, born in Salon, now Sri Lanka, became a metal worker and enamelist, uh, as well as president of the Society of Lady Artists, um, uh, Art Nouveau icon Annie French, painter, engraver, illustrator, uh, Georgina Greenlee specialised in the landscapes of tourist Scotland, uh, that kind of chocolate boxy image, they're really, um, really popular, Georgina Greenlee's work. Bessie McNichol exhibited internationally, she tragically tiled in childbirth. I would say before the mid 20th century, we lose 20% of our creative women to childbirth really early on in their careers. Quite often you see that woman has only written two books or three books, uh, or you know there's a small body of work and that's kind of why. Um, Annie Macbeth, who, or sorry, Anne Macbeth, who um, was an associate of Charles Rennie Macintosh and, and Margaret as well, uh, and they worked very closely together. She was also a committed suffragette. Uh, Eleanor Allen Moore, uh, who's who was born in Ireland and uh, studied in Glasgow and went on to paint street scenes in Shanghai and of the Yangtze River when she travelled to China. Portraitist Nora Gilson Gray, um, artist and embroiderer Jessie Newbury, who uh, uh, was also a suffragette, a committed suffragette actually, um, and provided later in her life ex exhibition space and studio space for other female artists. Um, and Frances MacDonald, Margaret's sister, so Charles Rennie Macintosh's sister-in-law, um, who worked with her sister uh, on large-scale projects quite often. So um, we're not sure <laughs> yet again. And I don't know how we're going to fit all these women. Yeah. Together, but I'm going to try and um, I'm going to try and write them all on my, in the morning. Glasgow Cathedral up here on this hill. Glasgow's quite hilly. And um, we're going to commemorate some of Scotland's medieval women, but also some women who are kind of a bit saintly. So the first person um, that will be commemorated up here is Princess Marjorie Bruce, who is the daughter of Robert the Bruce. She was captured by Edward I and contained in a cage. Uh, the, the, the practice of being caged or caging prisoners uh, in the medieval was horrific. You were literally put in a cage and hung off the side of a castle. And there are stories of women who lived for a year in a cage before they were um, uh, very often they were they were bought back they were ransomed back sometimes they were captured back oh my god medieval and um, so let's not think too much about that but um, Princess Marjorie Bruce who was kind of the mother of the Stuart dynasty so she's somebody that we'll be commemorating up here 
modern day saint. However, I think I would also like to commemorate up here is uh, Stella Ricci, who um, worked with Jewish children who were freed from Belsen concentration camp at the end of World War II. And she went on then to do missionary work in uh, Pakistan. And her home in the West End, at the other end of the map, was uh, very much a kind of open house for all comers. She was a really welcoming person. She, um, a really good person, I think, and um, sort of embodied that spirit, that side of, of Glasgow. Um, and then maybe just after the medieval, I'd like to commemorate here Jean Cameron, who was a Jacobite. She led 300 men to the raising of the Jacobite standard at Glenfinnan. She was said to be the only woman of rank uh, present uh, and she was known as Bonnie Jean Cameron and um, she became quite famous and uh, the press turned on her, the Hanoverian press when the Jacobites lost, turned on her and told all these horrible stories about her and she ended up in prison for a while and they said she was Bonnie Prince Charlie's mistress which, I, I mean, how can we tell? But probably not, unlikely. She fell into poverty, she ended up moving to Edinburgh for a thing. Jean Cameron, I think we should commemorate um, up at the cathedral as well. And then an accused witch, Maud Gold from Kilbarkin in Renfrewshire, and she was charged first as a lesbian and then as a witch, and she was uh, accused of assaulting her maidservant with what sounds in the medieval court records a bit like a sex toy. And um, it sounds like a sort of, um, I don't know, a ceramic dildo, maybe? Um, we don't know what happened to Maud. Uh, she may have been let off or she may, like many of convicted witches, have been drowned and then burned. We just, we don't know what really happened to her. The records are, are not full. Um, anyway, Maud Gold, um, we're going to commemorate her up here as well. So we're going to commemorate some women in Glasgow Green here. They're kind of disparate bunch, but I'm quite interested in them. So Rachel Johnson was a six foot Irish woman who smoked a pipe and um, she helped with strike breaking and apparently if, if some guy tried to you know give her any hassle she'd just pick him up and fill him in the Clyde because <laughs> she was enormous and very very strong We've all been and there. there is an extant photograph of her someone took a late Victorian photograph of Rachel Johnson um, uh, so yeah, I put her here for this because she's right next to the Clyde, so no nonsense, being so Rachel, what have you. And then Christian Shaw, Christian Shaw was actually from Paisley um, and she was a thread pioneer. Actually, it's, I think it is suspected now that she nicked the idea for her white thread. She found a new way to make white thread, but it wasn't really new and she'd perhaps traveled and found it in the Netherlands or somewhere like that and she brought it back. And obviously the whole thread industry is huge in Paisley and so Christian Shaw was very important. There is a dark past though to Christian Shaw when she was 11 she turned evidence against a group of people she said were witches and I think something like seven or eight people were killed because of Christian Shaw's child's, you know, as a child, the evidence that she gave. Susan Newell, the last woman to be hanged in Duke Street Prison Duke Street runs all the way along, very long street just up here, um, and so she's hanged for murder. And Rose Classical Kerrigan, so Rose, Rose was really interesting, she was a workers rights person and she led strikes and she also very openly talked about contraception and she took contraception and talked about taking contraception in the early 20th century even though she was married and didn't have any kids yet. So when contraception originally arrived and Mary Stokes' book came out, it was about being married, it was about having you know, enough kids already, and then as a married woman it was respectable to have um, to, to take contraception, and Rose was not having any of that. Uh, and so she, she um, talked openly and was vilified for saying that she was taking contraception because she didn't want to have kids at all. Um, she wanted to have kids yet, perhaps. Um, and uh, there is also a really good photograph of Rose um, and she led a workers' walkout in a factory in Glasgow. It's an imaginary city, isn't it? Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of really one of the things I found really interesting when I was researching for the Secret Supplies in Squares about.